René Girard, born in 1923 and died in 2015, was a French thinker whose thoughts spanned across the disciplines. His focus was on mythology, violence, sacrifice and religion, but the range and implications of his thoughts touch on history, psychology, literary criticism, anthropology. In fact, you could list every area of the humanities here. Girard seems to be able to answer a difficult question. How and why did culture emerge? Scholar Harold Vidra calls it a fundamental anthropology and tells us that Girard's thoughts can help us make sense of humanity's immense progress during the short time of its existence. In other words, the question is this. Why did the first myths and stories emerge, culture? And how do they underpin humanity's direction ever since? He's one of those rare thinkers that can change your entire way of looking at things. And while complicated, luckily his thought can be understood through a number of stages. Mimetic desire, scapegoating, and ritual. For Girard, mimetic theory, or mimetic desire, is central to how humans experience the world. One model of desire might simply look like this. A subject desires something, whether food, sex, company, conversation, or a physical object. But Girard argues that once basic needs are met, humans continue to desire, but not individually. Humans desire what other humans desire. We imitate, mirror, copy, mimic the desires of others. For Girard, then, desire looks more like this. He uses several terms to describe this. Triangular desire, desire according to another, imitated desire, and, mostly, mimetic desire. He writes, Human beings influence each other, and when they are together, they tend to desire the same objects. This is not because these objects are scarce, but because imitation governs desire. Man attempts to create a being out of himself that's essentially based on the desire of his fellow. We can see mimesis in a number of places, in the way children acquire language, or the way we copy fashions, music tastes, both as adults and as children, copying toy trends in the playground, for example. When the object desired can be shared, this doesn't lead to a problem. In fact, it can lead to cooperation. But when the object is finite, or is something two individuals or groups cannot simultaneously possess, this can lead to conflict. This mimetic desire can lead to what Girard calls a mimetic crisis. When individuals in a group mimic each other's desires over single objects, this can quickly turn into antagonism, which can then turn into violence. In a mimetic crisis, a mimetic snowballing can occur that leads to a war of all against all. Even resentment, suspicion or blame themselves are particular desires that can be copied, leading to a quick spiralling out of control. I desire to place blame or I desire a suspicion. Mimetic desire then can be dangerous. Girard argues that it's all too easy for us to overlook how fatal violence was to pre-state societies. Violence could easily spiral and destroy the cohesion of the group. Wrongdoing can lead to revenge, which can lead to reprisals, which can then lead to other reprisals. He writes, Vengeance is a vicious circle whose effect on primitive societies can only be surmised. For us, the circle has been broken. We owe our good fortune to one of our social institutions above all, our judicial system, which serves to deflect the menace of vengeance. Girard argues that for all crises, whether a natural disaster, a famine, a murder spree, a war, what's important is how it's dealt with within the group. As soon as one person places fault, handles something poorly, desires something to protect themselves or not the group, others copy and mimesis can abruptly spread. Think of scenes of panic during looting, during natural disasters, or crowds all breaking into anger at the same time. The Oedipus myth, one of the founding stories of Greek mythology, is most well known through the Greek playwright Sophocles' play, Oedipus the King. The play opens with a plague that's beset the city of Thebes. Sophocles tells us that, 
Our city, look around you, see with your own eyes, cannot lift her head from the depths, the red waves of death. Thebes is dying, a blight on the fresh crops and the rich pastures, cattle sicken and die, and the women die in labour, children stillborn, and the plague, the fiery god of fever, hurls down on the city, his lightning slashing through us, raging plague in all its vengeance, devastating the house of Cadmus, and black death, luxuriates in the raw, wailing miseries of Thebes. And we can see from this quote that the threat's not just the disaster, not just the plague, but the effect it has on the cultural and social order of the city, the cohesion of the group. The plague is a metaphor for a social crisis. Oedipus, Creon and Tiresias all place blame on each other, but also copy each other's blaming. After Oedipus blames Tiresias, Tiresias himself replies that, Is that so? I charge you then, submit to that decree you just laid down. From this day onwards, speak to no one. Not these citizens, not myself. You are the curse, the corruption of the land. It's in our nature to look for a cause to a crisis, or to lay blame and find responsibility in some way. The important question is always, why? was their chaos. This why needs to also resolve the mimetic crisis, to restore order to the group. Girard argues that the group will find a scapegoat. The scapegoat becomes a placeholder for responsibility. They bear the burden of blame and are either banished, imprisoned or killed. Once the scapegoat is identified and exiled or killed, Girard argues, we have the foundation for a story about what happened, a reminder to the group, the beginnings of human culture. By the end of the Oedipus myth, the main characters have united against Oedipus for committing patricide, regicide and incest, and he's then banished from the city. Girard shows this logic in many stories, and we can see a more contemporary example in William Golding's novel Lord of the Flies. Ralph is the leader of the group. Jack, his rival, calls another boy Fatty. Ralph tries to mimic, but outdo Jack. He's not Fatty, cried Ralph. His real name's Piggy. Piggy, Piggy, oh Piggy. A storm of laughter arose, and even the tiniest child joined in. For a moment, the boys were a closed circuit of sympathy with Piggy. Later, though, they bumped Piggy, who was burnt and yelled and danced. Immediately, Ralph and the crowd of boys were united and relieved by a storm of laughter. Piggy, once more, was the centre of social derision, so that everyone felt cheerful and normal. Girard argues that many novelists subconsciously draw on our mimetic nature. His first book, Deceit, Desire and the Novel, looks at Cervantes, Flaubert, Proust and Dostoevsky to see how their works are full of examples of mimesis. He looks at stories about collective violence against Jews, the other, the sick, lepers, witches, bogeymen of all kinds, and argues that they all follow this similar pattern. The third stage of Girard's theory involves the retelling of the event the logic behind why the event has to become mythical, sacred or religious. He argues that this formula is necessary. Mimetic desire leads to scapegoating, which leads to storytelling, which leads to myth and religion. In other words, gods grow out of scapegoats. The story of the scapegoat becomes a founding myth, the glue that holds the community together. The scapegoat figure becomes both terrible the source of evil, and sacred, because their death or exile saves the community. So what's important here is not necessarily the event itself, but the cultural retelling of the event. Wolfgang Palava writes that, for the mimetic theory, this represents a clear instance of the controlled repetition of the founding murder. In the biblical stories, for example, Christ became a scapegoat, was put to death, but later the lessons that surround him become a model for the community. Oedipus must be banished, he becomes a scapegoat, but he must also be remembered for it to be effective. Sacrificial rituals, too, are a way of retelling and redirecting the founding violence. 
sacrifice and the rituals that surround it are a controlled repetition of violence directed towards one particular victim that's importantly on the fringes of the group. Girard writes that the sacrifice serves to protect the entire community from its own violence. It prompts the entire community to choose victims outside itself. The role of sacrifice is to redirect the violence into its proper channels. The victims of sacrifice are always outside or at the fringes of society. Animals, prisoners, slaves, small children, unmarried adolescents, so as not to disrupt the order of society. The violence is directed at something that won't lead to retribution and won't then spiral out of control in a mimetic crisis. He says, the function of ritual is to purify violence, that is, to trick violence into spending itself on victims whose death will provoke no reprisals. Many stories have this mimetic structure. Myths often contain stereotypes of crisis, accusation, scapegoating, then ritual in the myth itself. In the Oedipus myth, Oedipus is banished for regicide, patricide and incest. And so the myth stands as a reminder of the spiral of violence that can result from all of these things. The lesson is not to disrupt the social order. Girard's argument is broad and some critics have protested that it claims too much and goes too far. But the consequences of the theory, if true, are far-reaching. He rejects the idea by thinkers like Rousseau that man is naturally good or cooperative. He also rejects the idea that religion and myth are something that humans can grow out of as they become more rational and secularise. And finally, Girard's thought provides a compelling answer to an unsettling question. Why, out of all living species, is the human being the most violent if you like these videos, I need your help. And here's my request. If you think you get the same value from four of these videos as you do from just one cup of coffee, then please consider pledging just a dollar per video. That's three to four dollars per month to keep this channel going. You can even limit your pledge to one dollar a month. And if you pledge $5, I'll add your name to the credits. To those that already support then and now, thank you so much. This channel just wouldn't exist without you. You can also hit like, share, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, etc. All of these things really contribute to helping then and now. I grow. Thanks for watching and see you next week.